In this video, I'm going to show you how I build this test stand to test batteries that we're manufacturing. This is the battery that we're testing. It's a 13S 2P battery. Uh, this one's kind of a small prototype. I have a thermocouple pasted on so that we can measure temperature. These are the two main battery leads. Starting with the negative battery cable, it goes through this shunt, which is used for measuring current. It goes into an IGBT, basically a solid state relay or transistor. From there, it goes into this heater and then through this heater. So there's two in series and then back to the positive end of the battery. These heaters are rated 24 volts at 900 watts each. And I'm using two in series because I have a 48 volt battery. This tank is two and a half gallons and I can open the top and you can see what the heaters look like inside. On the back of this two and a half gallon tank are some AN fittings. So if I need additional cooling, I can hook up a garden hose and pump some cold water through this. This meter is measuring amps from the shunt. It's measuring voltage at the source of the battery eliminating any of the voltage drop across the wires. It's calculating watts and watt hours, and watt hours is really the metric that we care about most for our battery. This is the IGBT, or solid state relay. This is what regulates the power going to the heaters. Uh, the large terminals are for the high current, and the small terminals are the signal that tells it to turn on and off, and it gets its on off signal from this function generator. This is basically outputting a pulse width modulated signal. Uh, basically it looks like a square wave and I can control how much time it's spent turned on versus off. I can change what frequency it runs at. This function generator can directly wire to the IGBT, but the IGBT has a lot of capacitance at the input and so it's really slow to turn on and turn off. Uh, so I have this amplifier, which goes in between. So the function generator signal goes through the amplifier and then to the IGBT. And instead of running milliamp current, this drives it up to several amps of current, which turns this on very quickly. This amplifier is a full H bridge, so it has transistors to turn on the 12 volts as well as the zero volts. So it's slamming on and slamming off to ground. Uh, so that drives this IGBT very quickly. If we put our oscilloscope probes across the input, we can see what the waveform looks like with and without the amplifier. Without the amplifier, you can see that it's kind of rounded at one kilohertz. It's taking almost one full cycle at one kilohertz to switch on, but it switches off very quickly. And here's what it looks like through the amplifier. This is still at one kilohertz. And if we crank it up to 10 kilohertz, it still looks perfectly square. Even at 100 kilohertz, 100 times faster, it still looks pretty square. Slow switching the IGBT adds to a lot of losses, uh, which generates heat. And I could feel the heat sink getting hot just running 30 amps without this amplifier circuit. The function generator is powered by this 12 volt battery. This is just a USB battery that I have a USB-C trigger to give me 12 volts. Right, so let's go ahead and turn on the enable and we can start to see current flow. So right now I'm pulling 28 amps. If I increase the duty on the pulse width modulation, you can see the current can go up. And as I turn it down, you can see the current go down. And you should be able to see this LED change brightness as well as I turn up the pulse width modulation. I have the BMS set to shut down if current gets above 30 amps, so that's what happened here. It'll automatically reset here in a second. And right now I'm running 50 hertz. And you can see the voltage measurements are really bouncing around. 
This is because the BMS is measuring cell voltages sequentially. So at any one instant, the current could be on for one cell measurement or off for another. This is called aliasing. If I turn the frequency up past the sampling rate of the BMS, everything kind of smooths out and takes an average. Nice and steady. All this wiring acts a little bit like a coil. It has some inductance. And what a coil wants to do is keep current the same Similar to how a capacitor wants to keep voltage the same, an inductor keeps current the same. So if we have 100 amps flowing through here with the switch closed, when the switch opens, the inductance wants to keep current 100 amps. And so it'll create a high voltage arc to try and maintain 100 amps of current. And we can see that voltage spike on the oscilloscope. I'm connecting the oscilloscope leads across the output of the IGBT. So when the IGBT is turned on, we'll measure zero volts because it'll be a dead short. And when the IGBT is off, we'll measure battery voltage around 48 volts. So as you can see, we have a nice square wave. We're at 5% duty right now. There's 50%. Um, I'll turn it down to 5%. So this looks like a nice square wave. I'm going to turn the voltage gain down just to make this smaller as I zoom in. And I'm going to stretch out the time. And as you can see, this leading edge has this huge voltage spike. And if I put the snubber across the output of the IGBT, you can see that it goes completely away. That's with the snubber, without the snubber, without the snubber. With the snubber, we're at 84 volts peak. Without the snubber, we're at 424 volts. The IGBT is only rated for 1200 volts, so I assume a spike above that would damage it. I was curious if the damping effect of the snubber had any effect on the shape of the square wave. This is what it looks like at 20 kilohertz with 50% duty cycle. This is without, and this is with the snubber. Even though we're driving a purely resistive load, it seems like a snubber is still required to protect the IGBT. Since the voltages were so high, I decided to use my 10x probe so I don't blow up the input on my oscilloscope. And all I'm doing here is connecting this three microfarad capacitor across the emitter of the IGBT. I made the mistake of using this electrolytic capacitor instead of a snubber at first. The electrolytic is 300 microfarad, and the snubber is 1 microfarad. This is charging and discharging with almost 400x the energy every cycle, and electrolytics don't have as low of a resistance as a film-wound capacitor like these snubbers. I don't know if you can hear. The insides are all shriveled up and this thing got really hot, so mental note, use a film capacitor for a snubber. I wanted to break down the IGBT circuit, do the bare basics. Here I have a battery on the output and I'm gonna apply power to the input and turn on a light bulb. And the light bulb stays lit until the input is discharged. I can do that with my fingers. Replacing my fingers and my 12 volt battery with my PWM circuit, we can control the light like a dimmer switch. Well, thanks again for watching. Hopefully you got something out of this video. Uh, stay tuned. I'm excited to show you the batteries that we're building on a much larger scale for our electric airplane projects. Uh, stay tuned and thanks again for watching.